Welcome to episode number 60 of the Animals at Home podcast. If you are new here, my name is Dylan Perrin and welcome to the show. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level creative care individualized for each animal. And as a reminder, if you are looking for more information on the podcast, you can head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find information on my show, Animals at Home, as well as Bryce Broom's show, Animals Everywhere. And if you are interested in supporting the show, there's a few very simple things you can do. The first one is give the show a rating on the Apple Podcasting app. A five-star rating really does help our visibility in the podcasting app itself. You can share the content. That is really the best thing you can do. Share it on Instagram or Facebook. Make sure you tag either my Facebook, Animals at Home, or the Instagram, Animals at Home CA, so I can repost that as well. I always appreciate when you guys share the content. And if you really want, there's also a donation button at the bottom of the page on the Animals at Home header on Animals at Home Network. And of course, that goes directly to supporting the show. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to thank our show's sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. If you are looking for any high-end reptile equipment, make sure you go to the link in either the YouTube description or the show notes. Those are affiliate links, so if you do end up purchasing something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, let's jump into today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with Harvey Tweets and Tom Whitehurst. They are the co-founders of Celtic Reptile and Amphibian. Harvey and Tom are up to a seriously interesting project. I'm actually just going to read the about section on their company's website so you can have a sort of an understanding of what they're up to. Celtic Reptile and Amphibian is a company that strives for the consolidation of reptile and amphibian species in Europe, leading the way to a more dynamic and interesting world. We do so by allowing otherwise unlikely experiences between humans and these fascinating animals to happen. Allowing the magic of nature to do her work, creating a vital link between these usually overlooked species, helping in the eventuality of their conservation. Abracadabra. So I don't think I really have to say much more than that. We had an excellent conversation surrounding the ethics of the hobby and the ethics of keeping reptiles. They have these incredible outdoor enclosures that they walk us through, how they build them, how they keep these animals outside year round, even during the winter. We discussed the importance of amphibians on the planet. And they also let us in on some really interesting business decisions that they've made that's allowed them to create some really unique forms of cash flow that I've not really seen in a reptile related business before. So without having said any more, let's just jump right into it. Enjoy the show. All right. Well, Harvey and Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for having us on. You guys have uh, a really interesting project on the works. I cannot wait to get into it. And it's it's definitely unique and there's tons of questions I have. So we're going to get into that. But before we do, let's just give a quick background on the two of you. So if you could just let us know how you got into the hobby and then and then after I'm, I want to figure out how you guys uh, met and then how you started working on this project. So Harvey, let's start with you. So... Um, so I came, you know, sort of into the hobby from like a conservation angle, um, mainly, you know, as it from a very young age, you know, fascinated with the natural world. And you quickly realize as you get older and you start to understand the problems that the, the, the natural world faces, that we've got to do something about the situation. And so um, one of the, the most sort of proactive approaches that I started to get into probably from, you know, from a relatively young age was sort of conservation, captive breeding, um, zoological societies, that sort of thing. Um, And understanding how crucial captive breeding um, will be, not just on an engagement level, but on a reintroduction level. Um, And so I, you know, was able to link up with so many amazing people breeding such an array of species across the UK. But unfortunately, European species in that region had been ever so neglected. Um, And so that's when I decided that we really need to do something about it because currently 50% of Europe's amphibians, for instance, could go extinct by 2050. We really do not have enough time to, you know, uh, to mess about. We need to get sort of a safety net in place, an assurance policy in place. And so that's when we started Celtic as, as a body to uh, captive breed and, and and create viable populations in captivity in the private sector as well as within institutions and, and the public sector um, and that's you know and Celtic was formed from the partnership between me and Tom yes so, so before before Tom jumps in as far as your journey in the reptile hobby goes were you already part of keeping animals at home as in terms of your, your private collection or, or having pets before you started Celtic yeah, uh, definitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, 
some of the first pets I had were uh, stick insects and I bred stick insects from a, a, like a really young age. Um, and I also had fish, tropical fish, marine fish. Uh, not They were not necessarily mine, but um, nevertheless grew up keeping fish uh, and did have a couple of exotic species uh, of reptile here and there. But I, I haven't really kept much, many exotic species, I don't keep in, anything indoors currently. So sure uh so yeah well i think you guys are going to paint a really good picture of an argument for keeping the pet trade healthy and alive or the reptile trade healthy and alive so tom what about yourself well my uh sort of story from how i got into the the hobby was not as not as profound as harvey's you know i wasn't i wasn't necessarily interested from a really young age but uh you know we've been mates for quite a long while so i've been going to his house he's coming been coming to my house and I've seen him, you know, keep the green lizards and the, the eye lizards and the tree frogs. tree frogs, yeah. And I thought, how how can you keep these species outside in the UK? You know, we have such terrible weather. And, uh, you know, it's just incredible to see, you know, these fluorescent green lizards running across logs in a greenhouse in the UK. So I was like, that's pretty cool. I want to get some. So I went and got some. And then we were like, okay, we've got... Between us, we've got quite a few animals now, and we've got the uh, experience keeping them. We're like, why don't we? Why don't we do something? Why don't we do something a bit more than just keep them? Let's try and make a sort of a business. Well, that's what Celtic is—a business, but an organisation where we can actually help these species in the wild and repopulate them, get them in back into the wild because they are threatened. You know, they're, they're decreasing in the wild, mm-hmm. and that's not great. And we want to do something about that. And that's sort of how I got into the hobby and how we both got into Celtic. This is my infection spread. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The, the classic reptile infection. It happens. So did you guys go to school together or did you just know each other from, from being in the same neighborhood? So yeah, yeah we went to school together. Hmm. Uh, we've known each other probably since we were, well, it was primary hmm. school, so hmm. five, six, maybe even younger than that. And one of the things like that me and Tom have noticed is that like we work together so well Mm. i I mean our qualities are are, are sort of bounce off each other so we work really well we get stuff done basically and Um, if you can if you have the opportunity to start a business or or you know an organization this has got to be the perfect thing because i'm I'm guessing right now you guys are obviously obsessed with it you have this deep passion for what you're doing and it's like every day you get to wake up and your job is this do you ever have that moment where you just like you can't believe I mean, I don't know if like this is hopefully something that's going to grow and be able to support you guys into the future. And right now, I'm sure you guys are just grinding and trying to you know establish that foundation. And maybe there's no monetary you know payoff just yet. But at the same time, do you get to wake up every day and just be excited to do what you're doing? Absolutely, every single day. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. It really, genuinely is incredible. Um, and I'm so fortunate to be able to to do what I do and to and and, and meet people that 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 we do with this like yourself mm-hmm. um with the yeah. organization with the company it's it really is a pleasure every single day yeah. yeah yeah I can definitely relate to that you just I'm just kind of working away on the podcast and then you kind of forget like oh this is it's sort of a job but at the same time it doesn't feel like I'm working it just kind of feels like I'm messing around <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's awesome so maybe you guys could outline what Celtic reptile and amphibian is and just to give the, the listeners a little bit of a picture and then I want to kind of talk about how it evolved and and, and get into a little more detail Okay, uh, so basically we're an organ- well, a company which focus on just European species of reptiles, so that's reptiles and amphibians, because in the wild, they, their numbers are decreasing, like we said, and they're quite underrepresented uh, in the community. So there's, you know, you've got the exotics that get a lot of attention, you've got your species in Africa that get a lot of attention, we're not saying that we don't like that or we don't support that. We're just saying that sometimes we need to start looking in our own back gardens, yeah. you know, looking at the native species and the European species yeah. that that's, the, have the same problems. That's exactly that. I mean, it's it's about sort of bringing awareness to this forgotten group of animals. I mean, some of these species, like Tom said, that drew him into sort of the hobby was the fact that, you know, tree frogs that can live in a British climate, you know, we've got sort of, meter long uh, lizards which can live happily outside through a british winter it's it's unbelievable 
Um, and to add to what Tom was saying about the fact that they're just in your backyard, um, I mean, we we go on trips every year to study the species' natural habitat. So I'm going in one in a week's time. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put a blog post about that up, I think, or maybe a video. Um, and um, so we know exactly what the care is for these species because it's either literally like an hour's plane fly away or just in the car mm -hmm. um so it, it's it's you know really it, it's really ideal specializing in a, in a region which you know surrounds yeah. us you don't have to travel all over the world to study what we keep just, yeah just the, and it's so true like there's something and it, i think this is very evident in the reptile trade is that there is this almost ev aversion to what is native to your area and sometimes that's a legal thing sometimes you can't keep native animals so um, don't recommend breaking the law, but if you are able to keep animals that are from your continent or from your area, it, for whatever reason, people just tend to not want to do that. They'd rather get that exotic fix, yeah. for example. But it's almost like it's a never ending thing because we, in the trade, we're always looking for the next rarest thing. People are always trying to breed the next rare morph. And it's, it, it's like a never, you can never quench that thirst in a way. So what, what do you guys think? Why do you think that is for people to really want things that aren't around them or not appreciate what's around them? I think that a part of that I would say is because people don't understand, people don't really yeah. appreciate the fact that these animals, you know, are everywhere and are so damn cool and, mm -hmm. and look just so close. Um, and I think that sort of it's that lack of understanding, but it's also that that lack of connection with the land and um, the ecosystems that are around you. Um, and I think that, What's interesting is that we've been we we read a lot into the hobby into the into the beginnings of the hobby, and the first animals that yeah. were ever kept by the first herpetologists who were mainly British or European were European species, mm -hmm. and they kept them out of because it's we you know we don't have the fascinating technologies like Arcadia, which are absolutely incredible, yeah. or you know all, all of these thermostats and and incredible systems, heating and lighting systems. And so people kind of had to keep their animals outdoors. And yes, there were, there were, there were instances of where iguanas were kept outdoors and obviously, unfortunately, they perished, but um, they quickly found that European species did really well. So the beginnings of the hobby are actually forged in keeping yeah. species outdoors and not only uh, native species, but European species because the first herpetologists were generally from uh, the European continent. Right. Yeah. So let's jump into the way you guys keep the animals because it's really fascinating. The enclosures are jaw dropping. And for someone that lives in Canada, it makes me think like, is there any way I can do this as well? Obviously, I cannot do it year round. It would be a death sentence for everything. But it, but I think there are lots of people or lots of places around the world where you can get a good season out of keeping animals outside. So maybe let, let's walk through some of these setups. You guys have essentially maybe let's start with the lot that you keep them on and so we can kind of build that picture of where this area is and then then we'll kind of break down what what it's in it so uh, we have a, a just a plot of land really and we have uh, some enclosures we have sand lizard enclosure on there which is this big enclosure with sand dune on it's just spectacular and the thing about keeping uh, these things outdoors is you don't have to provide any supplemental heating or UV or well they have natural insects so you don't have to feed them as much and obviously because of the natural insects the diet's more healthy because they're eating a range of insects uh, the the uv is just natural so it's actually better than using the uv bulbs or whatever because the sun is just the best way to get uv um what else well it's actually believe it or not it's actually less expensive to keep things outdoors than it is indoors mm -hmm. people believe that because you don't need the equipment and you don't need the 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 hides because you can just throw some logs in there <laughs> you know it's just just makes sense really to keep things outdoors because that's what how the animals live in the wild so why and, not and, do it? and that sort of enclosure planning stage always starts with our observations and from research that um, you know by the leading science uh, leading scientists in this field where this animal lives what it needs um, before we start thinking about a plan uh, of an enclosure um, so for instance the sand lizard um, is a is an endangered species in the UK it is threatened in Europe 
It's a beautiful species, about that big. It's actually the logo um, mm. for the, the Celtic, um, a beautiful species of lizard um, that is a, it lives at least in the north of its range on sand dunes by the coast and, and on sandy heaths. And so luckily we've gone to the habitat, we've seen them in situ um, and, and what their habits are like. And then boom, we're able to then formulate an idea of how do we replicate this um, in captivity. Um, and, and that's what we do with every species is we, we look at the natural habitat, what they're like, um, before we think about sort of, you know, planning the enclosure. A great example is the tree frog. So the European tree frog, Hyla arborea, is a beautiful species. It's only small. And uh, you would think tree frog, you'd think, you know, in tall oak trees or, or, you know, thick forests. But in fact, from observations from the wild, they actually much prefer scrubby, very low-lying um, grass and bramble and thickets. Um, and so that leads to an informed idea of how do we keep these animals. Um, and so we keep the tree frogs in with uh, brambles and raspberry brush, uh, bushes because that's what they that's what they like, and that's from pure observation. Right. Yeah, that is the benefit of keeping animals that are close enough to your range where you can actually just go to their habitats and see what it is and get give yourself an idea of what it looks like. And I, I know that the, the, with the tree frogs, there's a video on on your guys' channel of the males doing their mating calls. And it is really loud. It's amazing. It, of course, fa- from a reptile person, it's a fascinating thing. But I wonder about your neighbors. Do they go, what the hell is going on with this property with frogs on it? <laughs> um, they absolutely love it. That's awesome. Um, they absolutely <laughs> love it. I mean, I've had, so one neighbor this side was saying, like, um, it reminds them of Florida. Mm-hmm. And the other was saying, we sit out with a glass of wine and listen to the tree frogs call at night. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, which is absolutely brilliant. Um and again, that's a case of where my neighbours have nothing to do with wildlife or nature conservation and the infection spreading to them. And now they, they are really interested in what happens. I mean, the other day we had some lizards hatch and I showed them and wow, that's incredible. And, and that's, how it, that's how it's going to work. If we're yeah. going to have a chance at saving these species and, and thinking about ecosystem conservation, that's how it works. It starts on an individual basis from person to person. And it's those experiences that people will never forget. Mm -hmm. It's building that connection between real, raw nature. That is what we stand for. What is really what we stand for. It is. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That is, and and everybody has that fascination, but you're right. If they're not exposed to it, they don't even think about it. You don't even realize that they might, you know, be interested in this mating calls of a tree frog. And what's, what's crazy is the, the fact that we are a species. Mm-hmm. We're a species fundamentally that evolved on the plains of Africa. We're a species which, which is used to being immersed in you know, raw, wild nature. And not just nature, but adventure and, 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 and just you know, fascinating landscapes. And so where did it all go wrong? You know, where, where have we lost this raw, visceral connection with the land? Um, and it, it's got to be, you know, when we started urbanizing and when we, you know, we, we were cut off from how our food was produced. And when that happens, you create, you know, it, it's like housing an animal incorrectly. Mm-hmm. And we're doing, it, you know, even, you know, as humans, we're housing ourselves wrong. We've disconnected ourselves from nature. Um, and we've now more people living in cities than, than the, the rural environment, captive breeding. And keeping animals in captivity is really going to be a more holistic, sort of dynamic approach to rekindling that connection with nature. And that's what that's what we're doing. That's, that's, that's what, what we're about, really. Exactly. Yeah. I yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's no wonder that as humans we have a especially in the West, we have a an issue with mental health and depression and anxiety. And it's I, I was just having this conversation with someone the other day. It's it it's exactly the same reason that you would develop stress as keeping an animal, keeping them, not allowing them to act out the behaviors that they want to act out or that they've evolved to act out. We put ourselves in that situation when we you know, surround ourselves with concrete and Wi-Fi and just sound that's not natural sound. And it, it, so listening to your neighbors enjoying the frogs is almost like it, it sparks a, an inner human or an inner animal in them that allows them to relax. Yeah. Bang Very on. cool. So... Um. 
let, let's talk about how, because as far as the outdoor enclosures go, they're just amazing. And you know, a, a small outdoor enclosure is a massive indoor enclosure. Like that's the other thing is you have all this incredible space. So maybe you guys could just walk through how you create one of these enclosures outside. Well, so the first stage is like we've mentioned, we research the, uh, the habitat of the nat, how they would live naturally in the wild. But after, well, after that, we, uh, we sort of try and decide how big we want it. So uh, some more bigger enclosures obviously take more time to to draw up and sketch and come up with the ideas. So uh, the first step really is just getting getting the base in there because once you got the base, you know you can work with something there. Get the base in, and uh, yeah. So obviously some species prefer much taller enclosure like the tree frogs. And some species want the, the width, like the uh, eyed lizards. So uh, it's really te- each enclosure is tailored to the species that, we, that we're going to keep in there. I think that's really important. And, and we're living in a temperate climate, so talking about sort of the base, we've got to go down a substantial depth of soil, maybe, what would you say? 60, yeah. 60 centimetres. But, yeah, about 60 centimetres, so that the animals can burrow down and get out of the cold, and also the heat. I mean... We aren't necessarily, you know, Florida here, but it does get on select days. It does get, you know, warm, especially in, you know, greenhouse yeah, setup. Yeah, so yeah. the animals need some like an area to to be able to have a stable temperature. Um, and talking about sort of the height of the enclosure, um, I mean, some of these animals are incredibly intelligent and will get out of the enclosure. Oh, yeah. um, we've had experience. Not, not before. yeah, yeah, not hinting at anything there. But um, <laughs> so we've got. <laughs> We've always got to think about what's the appropriate way of sort of keeping the animal contained. So for lizards, it's usually um, an unscalable material, so at a sufficient height, so like polycarbonate, glass, acrylic, uh, sometimes even like PVC, yeah. plastics, that sort of Just thing. Just anything smooth so they can't grip Exactly. Um, I mean, that wouldn't work with some gecko species, but... But for the majority of, of the lacertids that we keep, that works, and so because they're open the top, big, right? Some of the, most of you, are, yeah. or I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them are open top. Completely, yeah, yeah, completely open top. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just sort of, I'd say sixty. Yeah, yeah, it's about well, the enclosure is sixty centimeters depth with the soil, yeah. sixty on top. That's yeah. usually the, the the basis, and uh, and and that pretty much keeps them contained yeah. in well. Um, but yeah, completely open tops. I mean. I've seen, we haven't done this yet and we'd love to do it in the future. I've seen enclosures with that principle being built on sort of a garden scale, huge, mm. with uh, with colonies of lizards in there and then like a coffee table in the middle. So you could take that that concept and and, and really, you know, put it on a massive scale. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. So as far as digging out, that's the one concern that many people have, keeping animals outside. What are you doing to prevent them from doing that? I mean, not all animals burrow, but many of them will. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes, depending on uh, the situation, we have put the concrete base, but that's obviously, well, that's just a bigger job. You can put hardcore down to stop things digging down. You can, you can line it actually with a pond liner but some, some lizards will be able to get through the pond liner, so you have to be careful. Uh, you, wood base, basically you can you can use whatever whatever you want. Yeah. As long as it's, they can't dig through it, it's fine. And you've just got to be, I mean, it, it, it's all about making sure that you go in and look and, and make sure that it is sort of like completely lizard proof. Um, and so, I mean, my favorite is probably, I mean, for ease of use is pond liner. I mean, you just literally put it in the base that you've dug out and then we just put some holes in the bottom to let the water drain out um, and that works an absolute treat. But if you want something more withstanding than sort of concrete or uh, hardcore is brilliant, really. So as far as maintenance goes, of, of course, you were saying the, the feeding is going to be less because they're going to be ha- hunting natural insects and whatnot. And are you, do you have to clean them or is this everything is just completely kind of takes care of itself on its own? We, we, really, we really don't clean the enclosures out at all. We, mm. It's not like we leave it messy or anything. We just let it do its thing. You know, got the insects in there to clean up the feces and just have, it's just the, the, this a, its is, own cli- this is, climate. Isn't it? This is bioactive keeping on steroids, yeah. basically. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I mean, all, all the natural insects move in and they, you know, 
They take care of all the feces and all the, the leftover food or whatever. The plants just grow like a jungle. Um, and uh, it basically, what, what we've said is it's practically keeping wild animals with a, just surrounded yeah. in perspex. Yes. It's what, wild animals. And I mean, that's the optimal you can get in the, hus- in, in the hobby, really, is keeping practically wild animals. Um, and what we find is, and I was talking to Liam Sinclair about this, was the fact that um, we do things in, with keeping outdoors that we unconsciously don't know. So, for instance, the wild insects that you indoors are going, why have I got that problem then? Why is the animal not the colour it is in the wild? Mm. Whereas because our care is practically keeping them wild, yeah. we tick every box, basically. Yeah. Um, for instance, um, talking about insects, the, there was a study published in 2011 by Peak, and it, it looked at uh, Lacerta's, so Western green lizards, and they were given, some were given no UV with commercial insects, and some were given no UV but with wild insects. And even in the absence of UV, the ones that were fed wild insects came out the, with a natural coloration. Right. And, and that kind of yeah, sums, it just sums up everything yeah. that, that we're saying. Really. Well, we know insects obviously synthesize vitamin D through UV as well, so that totally makes sense. And, and so do you supplement them with food, just like you know your own sort of feeder insects, or do you just let all of that happen naturally? Well, so we do provide feeder insects because... A lot of the insects inside the enclosure is too small to actually sustain. Well, we don't know. Maybe they could sustain the lizard, but we just like to, to put in a cricket. Well, not our cricket, but <laughs> in multiple crickets. Just feed them normally like you would indoors. Right. But they have that added, added option, an ant or a worm or whatever, whatever it wants. Yeah. And, and we, we would actually like to do a study um, with maybe some colleagues yeah. On we you know what percentage of the diet is natural insects, what percentage is uh, commercial. I mean, we just provide that option all the time, and of course, these are gut-loaded insects, dusted insects, um, and uh, we find that. We, I mean, I find that the the do not eat as many insects, you know, commercial insects as you would think, and I would imagine that is because probably the majority of their food is natural invertebrates, which yeah. is pretty. Yeah, and I mean the the feeder insects will actually, although it gets a bit too cold in the winter, the crickets will have multiple generations in the enclosures anyway, and hatch and feed the animals. Yeah, so it is like it, it is so, incredible, really. Like if we're starting up a new enclosure, what we often do with before even having any animals in there, just chuck some crickets in, yeah. chuck some mealworms, and give it a month or so, and they'll breed and breed and will have a nice stock in there for when yeah. when the lizards come in or whatever. And, and with the wild invertebrates, we provide logs and leaf litter and all sorts of hiding places to get those populations going. Um, you know, just like a bioactive enclosure, um, we you know log piles not only for the animals but for the for the um, lizards. Even sometimes it depends what species. I mean, we're incredibly careful with uh, we're incredibly um, sort of careful with diseases so we've got like quite a strict biosecurity protocol because that's always a risk uh, but sometimes we'll take sort of rotting logs and put those in because they're full of beetle larvae and mm-hmm. ants and all sorts of nice insects that yeah, the, yeah. the animals can eat yeah it's i mean the enclosures themselves literally look like somebody went out to the wild and just kind of put a little fence around a section of the wild and then there's the enclosure because that's they're, they're really well done and amazing and as far as the, let's talk about I had two questions and I'm just trying to think which order well let's talk let's talk about the winter first because the species that you're keeping outside obviously have in their native habitats the winters aren't as cold I think is that true no we find so some of these species will actually experience freezing temperatures I mean UK we, it's actually a problem that they don't get cold enough mm. so the UK we have quite mild winters um, I mean, sometimes we won't. We'll have a winter with only a frost or two. I mean, we're we're in the in the Midlands, down south. I've got I've got friends who've had who um, will have no frosts, and that can be a problem because it can trick the animals into thinking that oh, it, it's not we, you know it's not hibernate. Um, so sometimes it doesn't get cold enough, um, but we find that 
if you sort of design the enclosure well and provide good hibernating areas or brumating areas, the animals, and you provide that stable temperature, the animals do do okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, many of the species will experience, I mean, the tree frogs, for instance, have been observed to be to freeze themselves mm. solid. Yeah, and I've seen that myself. Yeah, um, on a, on Boxing Day, actually, a tree frog was frozen solid, which is incredible. Um, and so we find that many of the animals, are, the climate's very sympathetic. Yeah, I mean, Tom, um, the eyed lizards. That, that yeah. So so obviously it depends. Some European species are less tolerant than others of cold or weather. Mm. So some of them, are, you know, the eyed lizards. And so we keep them in greenhouses. And so that means just at night times and at win in the winter, it just stays that extra little bit warmer than it would outside, just so, so they can survive. And, 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 and add to that, the damp can be also a problem. Right. Yeah. So the greenhouses just keep a bit of that rain off. Um, I mean, you don't want it to dry out. The animals will actually desiccate if it's too dry, it's not humid enough. But sometimes, you know, the enclosures can get, you know, really damp in the winter, yeah. really damp. Is the greenhouse open top as well? Or do you just put them in there during the winter months? So, so, we, so the eye lizard, they're in the greenhouse year round. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's panels. They have, so the, pa- the roof is panels. So in the summer, well, or when the sun's out, we take the panels out. So the UVs okay, got can it. come unfiltered yeah. there. Yeah. And the panels go back in for in winter when the animals, you know, or at night time. Yeah, at night time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 really fascinating to keep, and it you know it breaks a lot of rules that people think like oh you know wild insects all these different things, but at the end of the day, you end up having a healthier stock of animals. And that's the thing; it completely blows into the water the idea that um, these animals need tw- twenty eight point five degrees. Don't go any warmer yeah. than twenty eight. Point- degrees and you know these animals i mean I've, tree frogs will sit out on branches at 45 degrees sorry do you do celsius I, i'm in canada so i'm familiar with celsius but if you want to drop some fahrenheit bombs that's okay too because a lot of the <laughs> listeners are american <laughs> i have a chart sitting right here that converts celsius to fahrenheit so i can easily do it in my head <laughs> at 45 degrees celsius seven degrees or, or sorry 45 degrees celsius yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, that is insane. Yeah. So, so tree frogs and amphibian will sit out at forty-five degrees C and 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 be completely fine. Yeah. Um, and we find these animals are so withstanding of, of the of the temperature fluctuations, and it's actually those temperature fluctuations that produce a hardier animal, but an animal that's more inclined to breed. If we don't have those absolutely freezing winters and then really warm summers, the animals won't breed in some occasions. Yeah. And right. so we need, you've got to remember that these animals for millions of years have lived in a temperate climate and have evolved to withstand practically everything yeah. Mother Nature can throw at them. And I think we don't have any understanding of how much they utilize the sun. So even in a cold day, it could be maybe five degrees outside. If it's bright sunshine, uh, the animal can be getting a ton of heat from that with, without any problems. So, and, and that might even be one of the reasons that they even eat less. They might be getting energy from the sun. And like you said, you cannot, as, as good as the, the products are, replicating sunlight is essentially impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And we've got the real thing. That's, the, that's the, the great thing. You can get you can get close, but you can never go all the way. And that's, that's just how it is really. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, what, what, what I will add is it's all about, with enclosures and keeping animals out, out, outside, it's all about opportunity, giving the animals opportunity to bass maybe here, maybe go under the ground here, maybe sit on a log over there. Maybe You know, you need to give your animals opportunity. I mean, it's not, we couldn't just put soil and two hides and expect the animals. You know, we need plants, you need logs, you need underground areas, you need stacks of rocks you need all sorts to let the animals you know do their thing um and and that's what you know we found i mean the if the animals didn't have this opportunity then maybe they would succumb to some of the really harsh temperatures you know on both extremes so i must add that i I want to stress that it's not take a vivarium with reptile carpet with two hides and stick it outside and you're fine 
Yeah, yeah my lizard has been cooked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is important that you are bringing all the aspects of nature, but then you start thinking of other things, even like wind, something that animals inside will never experience. Certain things like that are, are could be huge for welfare. One of the things that I think is going to drop next, if I'm, you know, we've we've had the UV debate, and the UV debate's won. I mean, I know we've still got people who deny it, but but the UV debate was was started in the 70s by Bert Landerworth and has, has finished. As far as I can say, there is no argument that animals need UV, not not just reptiles, but practically all species need UV. Mm-hmm. The next one I think is going to be airflow. I totally agree. In, I have the same thought two weeks ago. <laughs> in marine, in mar, do you know marine fish tanks or whatever, there's this massive push now for power heads. Mm-hmm. So or wave wave machines because the corals for, for ever since there's been oceans have you know evolved to have the movement of the water and i think it's going to be a, exactly the same yeah. with with reptiles we're going to realize that airflow is massively important why has my animal got a respiratory problem well have you got stagnant air oh yeah, yeah. just brewing the same air over yeah. and over and exactly over. <laughs> and, and you, you can imagine these animals will get battered with winds and it's mm-hmm. and, and we just you know the air is fresh and, and uh, I think that's really going to be the next one to drop. Arcadia better go on that and make yeah, some good fans. Get, get some fans. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, I, I absolutely see in the next couple of years, little basically computer fan type things being added to enclosures. Because you're exactly right. In the in the aquarium hobby, they do it all the time. It, there's a difference between your the flow rate of your tank as well as the, the amount you're filtering it. Like those are two separate things in the hobby. Yes, you need to filter it, but you also need way more flow rate than you might think, especially with some of those marine animals. So yeah, that's I think that would be really cool. And of course, keeping it outside, again, you don't have to worry about it. And again, it's one of those unconscious things that we do that, that, that we do just accidental <laughs> that you're you know that keeping indoors you're trying to replicate so yeah. that box is already picked for us if it if it turns out to be a box yeah so i just keep now um, now it's another bill on my plate uh now i have to add fans and more electricity <laughs> <laughs> as far as the temperatures what are some of the coldest temperatures you experience where you are just <clears throat> on a cold winter day my, my 10 yeah it's probably we've, we've had lower but it's it's not consistent. You say minus Probably 10? Minus, yeah, yeah, minus 10 okay. degrees so it's Celsius. Interesting. I mean, it's amazing because you would think something like a, an eye lizard or a jeweled lacerta, many people would think putting that down to a minus 10, of course, it's not going to be necessarily exposed to it because it'll be you know, hidden away somewhere, but still, it's going to be probably you know, zero degrees or maybe a little bit above. It seems insane from a keeper's point of view who's following the care sheet, but like you were saying, so, in their natural habitat, this is what they experience. Yeah, I mean... It doesn't get worrying for us because we know that they'll survive. But, you know, someone who's probably keeping it for the first time outside in a minus 10 degrees day comes, they must be, it can be worrying. Do you know, do you know what, what moorland is? So what, what, what was the word? Moorland. No. I just could say, so moorland is areas of, of really high ground in Britain that is, um, so we've got some just here that is managed, so it's burnt, and it's like it's like the Arctic. Um, and a, du- a pair of dual lacertas or eyed lizards escaped onto some moorland. I mean, like really high up in the north of England, further north than we are, and survived there for seven years. Wow. So it shows how hardy yeah. these animals are. Now the moorland is the wettest. It's like you would hate to be there on a cold winter yeah. day, and yet this species from the Mediterranean is living there, you know, for seven years. Incredible. That is amazing. Yeah, so it definitely has me thinking. Right now I'm in an apartment, so I need a home. I can't do outside in my apartment. But once I do have a, a, a yard, I... Not the roof. <laughs> get, get rid of the roof. Yeah, I think they should be fine. I think they'll be okay with that. <laughs> but as soon as I have a yard, I absolutely want to try building some outdoor closures. Of course, I'll only get a few months because it does get way too cold here. And of course, I have tropical species. But I th- I still think it would be a really interesting, even if you can get four months out of it, it would be huge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It'd be so good for your animals as well. Just even if it is for four months, it's just, it would help them I so mean, much. A great one would be, would a great one for you would probably be corn snakes, maybe some of the rat snake yeah. species. Yeah. I don't know if you, I don't know if you keep those, but I've, I know people in the UK who put their corn snakes out for the summer. Um, in in enclosures so yeah there's there's unlimited possibilities yeah any of the north american colubrids i could easily have uh in the in the summertime and the winter it would be good 
but but it would still be super cool. And it, so as far as your guys' philosophy is, like when I was reading your website, keeping outdoors is a foundational thing. Like there's no, hey, I'm going to have some inside. Everything is outdoors. So obviously we've talked about the benefits of it, but is there is there any specific reason that you have just, is, is, is it to do with the conservation and maybe the, the rewilding type aspect that you want to keep things outdoors? Um, yeah, I mean, just talking about like the importance to a company, like every animal that we sell comes with a certificate saying it's been raised, born, bred and raised outdoors from day one um, because we feel that that is like an imperative value to, 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 to Celtic. Um, uh, and, to, and why we do that is, is because, so it's ethical keeping. You know, it's the most it's the most natural way to keep these animals. And we were actually rationalizing this uh, yeah. yesterday. Why keep why keep animals in the highest possible standard you can do? You know, for us, that's outdoors. And we broke it down into two subsections. So we broke it down into the ideal, the ideal concept, which meaning that morally, as a person keeping an animal, you should advance. You should always, you know, get your husbandry to the best possible place uh, because that's just a commitment you made when you own that animal. The second is the utilitarian approach. If we keep animals outdoors, it means that we don't have to pay electricity bills. We don't have to feed as much insects. We're exposing, uh, exposing them to UV. And if we do all of these things, these animals will reward us. So they'll lay more eggs. They will be better representatives of those in the wild. So for scientific studies and the photography workshops we do, they're just way better. Um, and so I think, there's, I think that as keepers, and I want to actually, I might even publish an article about this. There is two approaches that we've got to think about. That's the ideal, the moral obligation, but also the fact that keeping animals Putting UV in with your, you know, if it's a, a royal python or a ball python, they're going to produce better eggs. They're going to produce healthier young. You know, we're not doing, you know, we don't just keep ethical keeping because, you know, we're, we're a bunch of hippies who would just want to sort of, <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? There's also, a, there's also a fundamental utilitarian reason yeah. for it, you know. Well, we just have better yield, which yeah, exactly. for, for a company, you know. Yield is great. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and 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 honestly, that that is a huge side of it as well because a lot of people need a a monetary reason to do it. And you know, one of my friends who I won't mention because this is more of an a- anecdotal anecdotal observation, but he had changed his animals that he was breeding to all UV in the last year or so, and all of a sudden had a hundred percent success rate in terms of birth birth rate, which was the first time ever. And everybody was kind of saying, "How did how did that happen?" The only thing that was changed was the UV. So there are certain ways that in, well, there are many ways that increasing your, your welfare pays off. And and for me, that is a huge part of keeping the animal is is really contending with the moral question because I, I ran up against that fence a few years ago asking myself, is it right for me to even be owning these? Like, I love the animals. I, I love nature. I love wildlife. And I, I got them because I, I love animals. But at the same time, what benefit am I having to them by keeping them in my room, in my apartment? It doesn't seem fair. So it took me a long time to work through that. And I think there are definite benefits to being able to keep animals and keep captive animals. And you guys are a testament to that. So what do you think the role of the trade is in, in terms of you know having a positive impact on the planet? Well, uh, obviously, captive breeding animals just means that there's more uh, secure populations of these species within our homes or within wherever they are. Uh, they are away from the wild. So if something bad happens to the, the, the habitats in the wild, say, I don't know, building sites move in or deforestation, whatever it might be, you know, these po- captive populations are away from that. They aren't affected and so that we can repopulate from these captive populations back into the wild and we can get the numbers back up again. Yeah. And that that is why captive breeding is so important. I mean, fundamentally... We are helping prevent extinction. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, that is, uh, you know, as a as a company, that is what we what we're trying to do. And I mean, that's a lot of weight on a on a on a <laughs> small establishment like us. But and I was thinking about this today. You know, genuinely keeping these animals. So we're actually we're actually getting some animals, some new uh, animals in that are, are vulnerable, vulnerable species. So just one step away from being endangered. Us keeping those is preserving the species fundamentally. Uh, I mean, you've got to be responsible. I mean, 
there's a lot the the hobby do, and, and I, I will just add this the hobby has a lot to answer for I mean, 100%. it had horrible things yeah. on a on a on a ethical level to the treatment of animals but also on a conservation you know level and i, I think that if we're talking about you know progressing becoming a the concept known as a caretaker species, the fact that we look after the earth instead of destroying it, we've got to look at how are we now going to take the hobby, advance, not only in, in, in keeping but also conservation, so that we have a duty, we have a reason to exist. Um, and so basically we're finding that, you know, we, we our animals are kept with maximum genetic diversity so that if there was the chance that they needed to be repopulated in the wild, they could. Uh, but without uh, without um, what's called outbreeding, so mixing lineages and subspecies together, which wouldn't naturally happen in the wild. Um, and so we we that's our, part of our ethos. That's what, what we yeah. live with. Um, and 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 we find that you know if we stick by that role as caretakers, as growing these species. Um, we, we really are sort of, we're, we're good. I'd say, yeah, we're good. Do you know what I mean? I, and, and that's one thing that, that I do on a daily basis. And like you said, should we even be keeping these species? You know, is it even right? Am I doing this correctly? And you've always got to, as a keeper, you've always got to critically analyse what you are doing on a daily basis. Um, is it a force for good or is it just just because? Um, and 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 that's what we do. And and I think that with keeping vulnerable species and with working out how to breed species that are declining in the wild, we are a force for good. Yeah. And and I hope that that you know that's that's how we're perceived. You know, as a, as, a, as a force for good. Yeah. And you're you're so right. The the hobby does have a lot to answer for. And and from my point of view, as a hobbyist, someone who's very involved in the trade, it's important that I and we take responsibility for everything. And the only way to do that is by looking at the negatives that have happened and then figuring out if there's a way to turn this into a positive. And I, I always almost picture like a fictional court case almost where we have reptile keepers that have to defend their case. We have a bunch of stuff in that file that doesn't go well for our, our case to keep animals. There is a, a It's a thick file. I'm not saying it's the only side to it. There's definitely a ton of positives, but... It, focusing on or just driving towards ethical care, conservation is is so important, and it's it's the only thing that I think will allow the the trade to continue in a positive way, or really can maybe continue at all. And I, yeah, I, and and what I'd say is like sort of getting rid of the hobby, getting rid of it entirely. I personally think would be a a draw, sort of you know a net loss rather than rather than getting rid of something bad because you know. The, you anyone keeping animals is creating a connection what i was talking about earlier with the natural world that is becoming so rare in the modern world and so i think even though you, uh, as you're saying dylan that you keep these animals in you know in your bedroom or wherever it is you're still creating that connection not just between you and that animal but with other people and surely there's some value in that yeah do you know what i mean and and that's what that's what we're trying to do because if we are showing that we are genuinely a force for good. We have a vested interest in in how these animals live, not just you know ethically and individually, but as a species. Surely that is a good thing. And we've got to learn from the mistakes that we've made yeah. in the past, not keeping animals with UV, pillaging wild populations, which has happened. Uh, and we've got to move on. We've got to we've got to reinvent the way that we we view things. But getting rid of the hobby, getting rid of this connection, this vital connection that we have, would be wrong and that's all personal analysis yeah yeah i totally agree i think that is one thing that the animal rights groups fail to look at is the amount of positives that come from the hobby like you said exposing people to animals many people who go into biology were exposed by through animals by you know pets and at an early age the trade provides a ton of scientific literature to to universities as the trade we can do a lot more because we're paying for it ourselves we don't have to go write a proposal it's like we can figure out how these species breed and whatnot and if you just take that out and just cut it off at the knees, you don't necessarily know what falls with it. And that is a really important thing for people to understand is like, yes, of course, there's some selfish things about the trade. We, we, we can get around that, but there's many positives. And if you just remove it, you might not even know what you've removed until it's way too late. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's like the idea if, if you give someone a, a tree frog, for example, and 
tell them that the the tree frog's natural habitat has been cut down or destroyed, they become like, oh god, this is terrible. Yeah. But if you, if that person didn't have a tree frog and never saw one and saw on the news that tree frogs are declining, they just would feel numb to it. Like yeah. this happens all the time. You just feel numb because you're so used to hearing these things. But as soon as you have a tree frog in front of you, as soon as you care for one yourself or any animal for that matter, yeah. you have that connection and you're like, okay, something needs to be done here. And I think this is that's just so vital for everyone to have that instinct. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But- so as far as rewilding goes, that's a concept that people talk about all the time, but a lot of times it's not practical. So what what are the what are the like is that possible to be introducing? I know I know in, in, in Europe they're actually doing that. They're introducing captive populations into the wild and they've done it. And it but it's one of those things that people say, well, it can never be done. It can absolutely be done, but maybe we can just, you know, cover that topic just briefly. Well, the the reason why I, you know about rewilding is that was the way that I got in, involved in terms of captive breeding, reintroduction, or whatever, and the fact that these animals are neglected. Um, and like a topic, I hope hopefully we touch on is like um, how amphibians interact with the environment, not individually, but as a whole species. Um, and so, talking about rewilding, if you take one tree frog or one frog, take any no any amphibian. Individually, that's probably five grams, you know, a small, small little thing. You take 10 hectares of marshland in the US or, or Europe, the, the amount of amphibians equates to the weight of a black rhinoceros, 1.5 tons. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And so what you understand is that you've got these tiny little animals having a tiny impact but together, collectively, they create a massive ecosystem service. An ecosystem service is a um, function or, or a system that nature provides that benefits humans. And so what do amphibians do? Well, amphibians, to start off with, eat pests. They eat insects. They eat pests that would otherwise eat our crops. Um, and I'm not just talking about a few, I'm talking about literally tons. I mean, when frogs emerge from the water as metamorphs, they will absolutely ravage aphids and they, that problem will be alleviated. Um, and also, because they eat insects, they reduce disease outbreaks. So diseases such as malaria, dengue fever, Lyme's disease are practically null because of these animals are consuming the vector insects. Um, and another one I'd like to add, and a study in 2014 that was conducted in uh, the... Uh, it was conducted in the US, I think it was on the East Coast, looked at salamanders and the salamanders' feeding preferences affected the climate. The salamanders would eat wood lice and, and earthworms and, and, and animals known as detritivores, animals which break down organic matter, so leaves and wood. And when that breakdown process happens, that digestion, you release greenhouse gases such as CO2 and methane. The salamanders, albeit tiny, but massive because of the size of the population, control the amount of carbon that is released from the forest floor. The actual amphibians have an effect on the very air that we breathe. They keep the climate stable. And so what you realise from this is that every single animal has a vital role in any ecosystem. And so if we take a place such as the UK, which has got a vastly reduced number of amphibians, albeit artificially, humans uh, because she, the, the UK has been occupied with, with intensive agriculture for so long, I'm talking since the Bronze Age, 6,000 years ago, we've, we've got this reduced amphibian population, which also means we've got a less diverse and strong ecosystem. And so talking about the rewilding narrative, the idea of reintroducing species, if we reintroduce species such as the pool frog or the agile frog or the moor frog that were extinct and are now extinct in the UK, we're not just putting a few frogs out. We're actually reconnecting parts of the web of life that have been broken for so long. We're actually creating a healthier planet for us all, not just for the frogs, but for, for human beings and every other living thing. And surely that is an inspiring narrative yeah. that we, people that need to take forward. And again, it's another core value that Celtic, that Celtic adopts. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's sort of the, on the lines of along the lines of the conversation I had with John Courtney Smith last week was 
as, as, a, as a trade, we can do a much better job of understanding the role that these animals play inside their environmental niche or their ecological niche. And for, for some reason, it's one reptiles and amphibians are kind of forgot about in that sense. We sort of just think that they're in the habitat, but they don't contribute in any way. And they do have this massive contribution. It's, it's pretty amazing. So as far as rewilding, how does that process work? Is that something that you guys are able to be involved in? Or is there sort of red tape that you have to go through to make sure you're not releasing sort of random animals? red tape like you've never seen um <laughs> incredibly hard but luckily the first stage of of any of this is that we're working out how to breed species on a level which would actually be good for reintroduction so introducing 10 frogs is not going to do anything introducing 100 200 300 a thousand two thousand is a is a lot better uh, so the first step is figuring out how to breed species which we're doing so we're currently working on that we are going to the next step, which is how do we actually do it? So we're, we are working on that now. And hopefully the third step will be reintroducing these animals. So slowly we are grinding away, at hopefully changing the perception and changing how you know we do this, basically. So we are getting there. We are getting there. But it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint when it comes to reintroductions. And it should be. I, I'm not advocating that we release any old animal out to it. That's not the case. Every animal needs to be critically analysed. What will its impact be? You know, what the risks, disease risks, etc. But at the same time, we shouldn't be overly, overly critical because the ecosystems will just suffer as a result. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're sort of in phase one of that process and it, and it requires... So it's, it's really fascinating. As far as Celtic goes, did you guys sit down and really work a framework around this before you started or did it was did it kind of morph the the sort of the ethos and the philosophy of it morph as you guys went or 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 was there a meeting that you guys had where you just laid it all out on on the table well in the beginning it it was quite two-dimensional really it's just the fact the idea actually that we get some species we breed them and then we'll go from there just sell them or whatever but as we went along we, we decided that there's, there's much more to just breeding animals and selling them. We don't want to be a pet shop or a, a, a large-scale yeah. breeder who just breeds and sells, breeds and sells. We don't want to do that. We want to contribute. So we we have sat down, haven't we, yeah. many times and just discussed what what ideas we want to... Yeah, like the ethos. Yeah, the ethos. What sort of ideas we want to bring to Celtic and how we want to implement them. And rewilding and uh, conservation is probably the key, the key yeah, one, yeah. the most important one for us. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love the idea of it, and I think the it would be interesting if we could get more people to take on a similar ethos in terms of a breeding operation. Like, there's so many people out there that are just excellent breeders, but they're just breeding, you know, corn snake morphs or ball python morphs, and you can get so much more out of out of you know widening your horizons. It's exactly that that I've said to Tom is, is, is disrespect to an animal. That is utter disrespect to an animal which mm-hmm. is perfectly evolved for its ecosystem and has a function to play in the grand scheme of things. I was, you know, one of the things that I've said is go and look at a frog or a snake up close, look at it, and immediately you're humbled because it just shows that you are no more important than that animal. Mm-hmm. You are just equally evolved as that animal. And you, what you realize is that, that every single living thing genuinely has some intrinsic value, or I'd say the same intrinsic value yeah. as everything else. Um, and, and, and that's, again, that goes back to when we we're talking about making connections between the natural world and people. But, and, and, and I just think that that sort of industrial carelessness of breeding is is just disrespectful i really do just think it's disrespectful i mean in some ways yeah you can be sympathetic but one of the things i'll say one of the arguments that's made is oh i can't make a decent i can't make a decent margin if i'm not keeping animals in 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 racks bollocks is what i say yeah. complete bollocks i mean it, it, it genuinely upsets me that you know we treat these animals uh, like so many breeders do not to name names um and we really need to be thinking about, you know, is this actually, is this actually the, the, the way we should be going about the hobby if we're talking, talking about sustainably, you know, going forward, you know, uh, creating a, a reason for why the hobby exists. 
Uh, I think that's that yeah. I, before I get too riled up. <laughs> I think that. I'll, <laughs> yeah, well, I, of course, I, I have the same opinion. And, you know, the, the whole margin argument, well, I need to make my margins thick enough to be able to sell these animals because all of a sudden the, you know, I, I can, the, the $40 corn snake won't be a $40 corn snake anymore. And my response to that is, well, why does the corn snake need to be $40? Why doesn't, it doesn't need to be that price. It could be maybe 80 or 100. Maybe that would be better to stop people from impulse purchasing animals. Of course, that's a whole other conversation. But but I totally agree. The the industrialized style care is is yeah disrespectful is is a great way to put it. Do you guys think that those people, if they were shown a different way, would be interested in doing it, or are they in it for a different reason? Or or I shouldn't say well, I guess we could say the wrong reason. They're they're not in it for the hobby or the what we're talking about here, having a protection over the animals. Or do you, do you think we can change their mind in that case? Like they are they are still passionate about animals. You have to assume. Yeah, I think. There's, there's two t- types of people who keep things in racks. There's people who don't know any better, so they haven't been exposed to maybe the idea of keeping outdoors or with all these fancy setups with lighting and UV and stuff like that, with bioactive uh, setups as well. But And then there's the people that they, they know that they can treat their animals better, but they just they just want the money. Mm-hmm. And that is just it's sad, really. Yeah. Because we're, we're proof that you don't need to keep them in racks to make money you know we make we i'm not obviously not going to tell you how much we make but we make enough so that we're sustainable and we can continue to grow and i think that's all that you want for a business and that's all that we want we want to be able to grow to the point where we can actually make an impact on uh, the wild mm-hmm. in a good way yeah and i you know i've had several people message me who were in that first group that you mentioned who are kind of wrapped rack keepers but didn't really know any better and then they're super thankful for the information on the podcast because it's pointed them into a new direction and they're just incredibly supportive over it and you know there's a video that i'll put out maybe later today where i'm just messing around with my jungle carpet python enclosure and adding some plants and one of the things i noticed is once i really filled up that enclosure with plants when he was the snake was climbing through the back of the plants where there's some sort of beams of light and shade you can see the snake in the background, you all of a sudden it becomes very clear why the pattern is the way the pattern is. Like it, you know, it's a very stark snake. It's yellow and black and it doesn't really look like, how is that camouflage? But then all of a sudden when he's back there, it's like I could barely tell the difference between beams of light and the yellow patches on his, on his body and same with the shade. And that's the sort of thing that will never reveal itself if you don't advance the care. That, yes, so exactly. true. Absolutely true. And, and I mean, that, that's the lucky thing that we said with living so close to so where we can see the animals and their habits in the wild, we're able to see, right, okay, the green lizard basks at that time, it basks there, then it goes underground at that time. Do you know what I mean? And we can cross-check. I mean, it's hard for, it's not like you could go to Australia, is it, Dylan, just like tomorrow, right, let's go, and just see how jungle carpet pythons you exactly. know, live. But, but that's that's the, the great thing with keeping native or, or regional species is because, you know, we can always cross check between you know how the animals are living in the wild and and uh, in captivity yeah no no definitely and uh, there's a couple other things i wanted to chat about before we go is one you guys have this other really unique side to the business which is this the media side so maybe we could talk about that because i think that's a that is another cash flow stream that you could add if you were not doing industrialized care. Like no one's going to come take pictures of your paper towel, but people will take pictures of the setups that you have. So maybe you could just quickly talk, talk about that. Well, so we, so we have these, uh, I think you're on about the, the photography aspect. Mm-hmm. We, have, we are running photography workshops where people can come down to our facility and just we have set up. So these enclosures are specifically designed for people for photography. So they've got like the little glass square so they can get the camera in or whatever. And uh, yeah, we've noticed that people are just blown away by the photos that they can actually capture because, you know, you th- when you think of captive breeding or keeping pets is basically what we're doing, uh, you don't think of having a natural landscape around it. Yeah. You know, these photographers are taking photos that you could not distinguish from another photographer every, taking every it single in the wild. plant that's in the photography yeah. sets and in the in the photography enclosures is native to the species range some uh, sets have even been uh, legally extracted habitat so we've able we've been able to take out sections of habitat exactly where these animals are from 
which is really which has been yeah. really lucky to be able to do so it's it's genuinely indistinguishable and the benefits to that is these animals are accustomed to people so they won't just you know run away and hide then they'll actually get become yeah. uh, the photogenic uh, and also there is some again photography's got a lot to answer for in terms of reptiles i mean I, we've seen bad practice where people will go and catch a snake and it'll be abused for for quite a while underneath a lens we completely get rid of that we don't rely on any wild animals they're all captive subjects which are accustomed to people yeah. so again ethically it's just far superior than than what is you know the norm currently well the enclosures that that they live in is the same enclosure yeah. that is adapted for photography so you don't have to move them doesn't they don't get stressed or anything it's just perfect really yeah. And, and 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 to that about the media that you were just mentioning yeah. about because of this and because that we keep animals which are regional and not many other people do um you know broadcasting institutions universities are always in touch about um you know getting us either to that come to their establishment or those come uh, them come to us to you know uh, photograph and video the animals for whatever content it may be whether it's documentaries or uh, workshops or photography, whatever it is. So we're always getting yeah. requests, which is which is we're really thankful. And, and the great thing about that is it ticks one of the ethos uh, boxes about exposing these animals to the public. So um, incidentally, it's another re- revenue stream, but it's also a, another checkbox ticked in terms of exposure for these animals. Yeah, it's it's really cool. It's and it's almost like you know companies are always looking for stock footage or b-roll of whatnot of animals that are in the native habitat and yeah when you watch the films of those what they've come and taken at your uh, facility there's no way to tell that it's not a wild animal you have these really cool sets so that is something that i think i've never seen before I, i've not i don't know if you guys just came up with that idea or you saw it somewhere but it, it is a really cool idea and i think that is something that would promote people to care this way and you know give them another cash flow and just like you said it it also shows people who are not familiar with these animals it exposes to them them to them yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so let's i know one thing that we kind of started on facebook yesterday was talking about animal rights versus animal welfare and i would love to finish off with that topic because it's a it is a difficult topic to discuss because there there, there's a very thin and blurry line between the two and i would say maybe as an easy definition animal rights tends to or i shouldn't say tend to be they are very much anti-pet and animal welfare are more sort of along our philosophies is just improving the care and they're not necessarily anti-pet. So uh, you had said that you had spent some time thinking about it, Harvey, and, and maybe had outlined it in your brain. So maybe you could kind of lay that out. It's a hard one. I, I like, <laughs> yeah, I like what, what John Courtney Smith said on the podcast, that he fundamentally believes animals do have rights. Mm-hmm. And I agree with that. What I'll say is I'm definitely more on the welfare side because we cannot be thinking about a connection with nature and improving nature, this idea of a caretaker species, without animals in captivity. We cannot. We cannot. We genuinely cannot. Species would be going extinct at an alarming rate. They are doing, but even more so if we do not have animals in captivity. Most amphibian reintroductions that have occurred have been completely successful. Not that would not be the case if there were any, any animals in, in, in if there were no animals in captivity. So fundamentally, the, we need animals in captivity just for the conservation point of view, but also for that connection point of view. Yes, there are always going to be good keepers, there are always going to be bad keepers, but it's a way of advancing, as we've said, advancing, pushing, so that the 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 bad keepers become the good keepers. You know that the the, the, the to the standard of the good keepers, if you know what I mean, you know, pushing and keep pushing forward, um, and 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 we've got to acknowledge that it's it would be it's completely it would be completely delusional to think that we could not keep our, we we can't keep animals in captivity. We need to. We we need to. It would be ideal not to. And again, it comes back to when we were thinking: is it even right? Should we even be keeping these animals in captivity? But when you think about it from a fundamental point of view, sort of a conservation point of view, you know, we we cannot say, no, we shouldn't have animals in captivity. It's interesting because this debate I, 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 I've, I've spoke to, to zookeepers about, you know, friends of mine, and they've said, in all honesty, I don't understand the argument that for many species, the wild is better than captivity. 
I mean, you've got a a uh, organic diet tailored to that species in a zoo, for instance. You've got no threat, so no elevated cortisol levels, um, and you've got increasingly larger and more psychologically informed enclosures. And 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 you know, zookeepers and, and people who are involved with zoos increasingly say, "I don't." understand the argument i don't see what 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 fact the argument is is based in i i say i can sympathize with 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 why animals should be in the wild because there are plenty of bad keepers but in terms of if you were a good keeper i don't i, I don't know where the argument gains way i don't say this like i'm incredibly opinionated in one way or another because we aren't as, a, as an organization we want to be as sort of plastic as possible and be able to adapt and be able to change. Um, and, and that's, you know, the same as a person. I, you know, it's just that they're just my thoughts, you know, but the hobby has got a lot to answer for, as we've said, and, and it's got to advance and it's got to change. But we've also got to realise that it's not realistic to have animals not living in captivity anytime soon. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, the, yeah, the animal rights groups don't contend with the positives from the, from the keeping pets. Like, they don't contend with it at all. They just say it, it's, it's a very hard line position. And, it, and it, it's awkward to talk about because as a keeper, you, as you just said, and I agree, animals do have rights. So you're sort of invoking the sort of the foundation of an animal rights movement when we say that. But it's, it's an, a less extreme movement. Like, of course... I believe that these animals are sentient and they deserve everything I can give them. And without that philosophy, it would be very easy for me to keep in an industrial sort of rack style system and, and not, you know, not care about enriching their lives and, and whatnot. But at the same time, there is so much we can gain from keeping them, as you said, in captivity that it, it, it's just this, it's this funny thing that happens when we discuss animal welfare. It's so close to animal rights, it becomes uncomfortable. And many keepers kind of run for the doors because we've had to deal with so much from animal rights groups. I'm sure you've seen that the uh, what is it the ball python documentary that came out a few months ago that was you know kind of a mess in terms of but at the same time they have some points yeah 100 percent. i mean i completely sympathize with the animal rights uh, group's point completely i mm -hmm. take on everything they say on board i may not agree with everything but everything that they say i take on board you know yes. because that is a commitment to these animals that you know they're they're just because they, just because you know, we have differing points of view, doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk to each other and we shouldn't have dialogue. That would just be that would just be stupid. Yeah. That genuine, we need that connection with other points of view. Mm -hmm. Because I never, for once, claim that Celtic is a is is a hundred percent right, a hundred percent keep your animals outdoors. This is the only way. I never, for once, say that. We always follow the evidence and we follow what 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 yeah. what you know, different anecdotal evidence too. Um, and so everything, every point of view we take on board, we may not agree with it and we may not put it in practice because that's what, you know, that's again, our personal, you know, opinion, but everything that, you know, even if an animal rights group says, we take it on board, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying in terms of taking responsibility for it. Yeah, they, they've pointed some things out that are a little bit weird or that are bad in the hobby and they've also kind of misinterpreted some things. But at the same time, if we don't, if we're leaving things for them to interpret incorrectly, that is kind of our fault, you know? So, you know, promoting what we're doing in a positive way is really the only way to overcome that. And I had another another thought there that that has disappeared in terms of, you know, it might come back to me. Is there, as, as I'll ask you this last question and I'll see if I can remember, is there anything else that we haven't talked about today that you guys wanted to mention as, as we're wrapping up? We pretty much. I think we pretty much. I think we. I'm really happy with with what we've got. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. No, that was fantastic. I'm just. I wish I could remember that last thing I was going to say. I think it was about. It's gone. It, uh, you know, when I'm editing it, I'll remember it because whatever I said before will trigger that thought. But uh, anyway, this was a fantastic conversation. I, I I am. I just love the philosophy that you guys have, and I really hope that this can be almost like a model for other people that are trying to get into into a reptile business because there are so many different ways you can create a business surrounding reptiles. And I understand why somebody would want to create a business with reptiles because it's a passion and, but you know, breeding ball python morphs is not the only way to do it. And this is the more ethical way. No, that's what I was going to say. 
and, and this this might get a little bit too woo woo in a way, but when and you, you'd mentioned about you know what you're doing is good, and I like that word good, and I can relate to that because when I make a change for the better in my enclosures, you do feel good about it, and the animal shows you that reward, and I don't think that is a you know, just a personal feeling like, oh, I, I feel good about myself. It's like, you know, self-esteem or something. There's something deeper going on there. When you do something good for the environment, or the ecosystem, or even just the individual animals, there's something deeper that's going on that I can't really explain, but it's not just, you know, a pat on myself on the back. Hey, I feel good about what I did today. It's something deeper than that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, re, it's a rekindling with the wild, I think, you know, sort of improvement to the environment, caring for the environment is 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 a spark to that evolutionary um part of us that 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 was that has been in this dance with mother nature for so long and i'm sure that's what it is it's yeah. this you know for instance the color green is the most soothing color to the eye because if you're in a green environment you know it means plenty it means lots of lots of plant life lots of food and so it makes sense you know because again talking about you know evolution and so I would imagine it, it, it is, it's that part of you, which is, 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 is ingrained into the wild. That's, that's, yeah. that's singing to you saying, well done. And, yeah. and giving you that hope of me. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we, we say good because we know that when it's not the best, yeah, like yeah. obviously we could make our enclosures a hundred times bigger and that would be better for the animals. But we know we can improve our husbandry. And that's the way but we've got to look at we it. Just, yeah, we just, yeah, we just look at it as, we're keeping them good. We're not keeping them the best because we physically it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't do that. So yeah. But it's all about it, and that's one of the things that I want to say is one of the worries that we've had is we don't want to appear and and even to sort of keepers like yourself, Dylan, who are keeping stuff indoors. I don't want to appear for one minute elitist like <laughs> this is the way to do it. because the whole. Uh, science of keeping animals in captive breeding is is it ever evolving you know we learn things new literally every day we learn uh, new animal behavior every single yeah. day uh, i mean uh, recently I've, I've started putting pieces of slate in the enclosures so the animals can bask even on a dull day like today that's an improvement and 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 it's and, and that's what people have got to realize is if you are keeping something that's in in unoptimal conditions that's fine as it's a good step that you're actually watching this podcast because you're on that road yeah. to improving the care. And that's all it's about. It's about being understanding that people, that, that people want to learn and that people want to change. And if we, get, if we can get to that point where virtually every keeper wants to change and wants to learn, surely the, uh, the, the, the husbandry can be a force for good. Yeah. And we understand that not every person can keep outdoors because not everyone yeah, has yeah. a garden, not everyone has the space or the climate. So we we are a bit out, big advocators, sorry, advocators of uh, uh, keeping indoors with the Arcadia products or just with the uh, the lighting and everything. You know, Excellent. people like yourself and uh, Liam Sinclair yeah. and uh, JTB Reptiles. Yeah. You know that those people are showing people how to keep indoors and we love that yeah just as much as we love keeping outdoors yeah yeah because it's just as important yeah yeah it is totally and I, I always say it's almost there's no need for a how to care guide for a species although there is but just to make a point there's no need for a how to care guide for the species it's more a how to think about caring for the species and how you think about it is that that philosophy of progression that you're not done you're never done it's just you're at it's a mark in the sand and the progress will flow from there. And yeah. talking about sort of care guides, I mean, some of these species that we're keeping, there's nothing on them. Mm. Like literally no I mean, even to the point where I've gone into papers, so I found captive bre uh, breeding papers that are in Russian, wrote during the Soviet Union times, translated them just to try and get some inkling <laughs> of how to keep these animals. That's awesome. And, and I mean, real dynamism in that. It's really fun. Um, and I mean, keeping outdoors does give you the leeway, as I say, about options, giving your animal opportunities. I mean, if you provided a massive enclosure, you know, huge with a pond, with a really well, you know, thick vegetation area, an area with bare, a bare patch, a rocky area, you would quickly learn that the animal sort of prefers some, you know, part of the enclosure. And that's kind of what we do is we experiment. 
um, to see what the animal wants and 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 that's always important so from our point of view I, we completely agree you don't need a care guide i can understand you know beginners and whatever it, it condenses the information down and it's easy but but again it's a science and science is always changing and yeah. and, and that's what we embrace yeah i love that well i think that's a great place to wrap up can you guys let everybody know where you can be found online yeah yeah so uh, i mean well this is actually back to front isn't I did, it? I'll yeah i just can read it right thing. Oh, you can, oh, oh, it's, yeah, so just a yeah. webcam then. So www.celticreptileamphibian.co.uk. Yeah. And we're also on Facebook, Celtic Reptile. Well, it's just that on Facebook and on Instagram. So and, and Kel- YouTube. And YouTube. Yeah. Celtic Reptile Amphibian, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We uh, On YouTube, we post uh, at least once a week. Uh, we're posting daily on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, so yeah, you can find us, you can find us there. We'd look, we'd appreciate it if we grow this community. Yeah. So if you do give us a like, subscribe or follow, much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Of course I'll have everything in the show notes and yeah, I highly recommend going to check out your work and especially at the YouTube channel because you can sort of see the enclosures and everything and, and it's, it's awesome. So Harvey, Tom, thank you very much. This was an absolute pleasure. Pleasure. I really appreciate you uh, joining me. Yeah, this was thank great. You. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. <laughs> no, cool. I can see it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's properly. It's hard to make out the website just from just because of the way the webcam is, but I'll make sure everything is in the in the show notes so people will find it no problem. But I can definitely see Celtic Reptile, and it's a great name too. That's a, just a fantastic name. Uh, I don't think did we did we, we mention we the did origins? A bit. We did. Oh, we did. The name. We did a little bit. Yeah. The, we're always asked. Do you know what the Celtic countries are? No, not really. <laughs> well, hold on. Before you go into that, I can I can add this in as a bonus little clip here. So if you want to kind of think of it as a is a section that I can add into the podcast if you're if you're good with that. Yeah, 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 fine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go so go ahead. ahead. So we're always asked, are we based in Scotland, Ireland, or Brittany and France? And we're not based in either of those. We're in the middle of England. Um, and the reason being is um, the Celtic countries are the last remnants of, of Celtic culture. So right. the, Celts, the Celts were a tribe that, that back sort of before the Romans – we're all the way across Britain, across Ireland, across France, in northern Spain, all the way through to Germany, through to, to Eastern Europe, and as far south as the Mediterranean. So this vast tribe, and, and that's where we got the name from, because um, every animal that we keep is from that region, but also because um, during that time was when there would have been a much more diverse array of amphibians and reptiles, uh, both on the continent, but mainly in Britain. So there was a lot, there was like double as many species as there is today. And that works into the rewilding context. So yeah, that's where the name come from. And no, we're not based in Scotland, Ireland or, or, or Brittany <laughs> or Wales, actually. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's where the names come from. Yeah, that's, um, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people think that, I mean, I, I'm familiar with the Celts in, in terms of some of the history. I forget, was it the Gauls that kind of wiped yeah. them out a little bit? Yeah, so- yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly familiar with that, so I, I knew. But uh, so many of us in North America, especially, associate Celtic with Scotland for sure, for for whatever reason. Yeah, it, and well, uh, a lot of people in the UK do as yeah, well. But yeah, 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 yeah. But no, it was it was a it was a completely sort of massive tribe, huge area, um, and they were kind of the last hunter gatherers. Now, I have an obsession personally with hunter gatherers. The hunter gatherers <laughs> societies. I mean, the Native American, the the pipeline recently. I'm, it was a applauding them for, for being able to win against the, the oil pipeline mm-hmm. in America. Uh, but I have an obsession with, with hunter-gatherers, and the last hunter-gatherers in Europe were the Celts before then agriculture started to take place. So it's a bit of a bit of a sort of a like microcosm of, of obsession about hunter-gatherers leaked in with the name. But, <laughs> well, that's awesome. It has some good meaning behind it then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, now we are officially done the episode. As we were chatting after we officially ended the recording, Tom and Harvey realized they didn't tell me how the name Celtic Reptile came about. So I was happy to include that into the podcast because I think it is really, really interesting. Well, Tom and Harvey, again, thank you very much. That was an excellent episode of the podcast. I had a blast chatting with you guys. I really hope that many of the listeners go and check you out and subscribe to your channel and follow your amazing projects. I cannot wait to see how Celtic Reptile and Amphibian will evolve in the future. And of course, if you are looking for any more information from this episode of the podcast, make sure you go to animalsathomenetwork.com and click on the Animals at Home head 
header and you will see a tile or an episode tile for this episode, episode number 60. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you did enjoy it, I would appreciate a share on either Instagram or Facebook. Make sure you tag me so I know that you did it. And if you are interested in supporting the podcast in other ways, you can give the podcast a rating on the Apple Podcasting app. That really does help us out a lot. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com. They are the sponsor of this podcast and you can find more information about them on the YouTube description or the show notes. I will talk to you guys next episode.